Um, hello, good morning, good evening, uh, depending on wherever you are. Uh, my name is Itika and I am the India Editor for Quads. I will be moderating today's session. Uh, the topic of discussion today is negotiating full employment to close gender gap. Uh, and we have with us uh, two eminent voices. We will shortly probably be joined by one more. Uh, we have around 45 minutes to discuss this. Um, and we'll find some relevant answers to some uh, questions that are very important uh, in the current scenario. Uh, we have with us Amelia, who is the executive director and general partner at MCI Partners. And we have Marnie, who is the managing director for Australia and New Zealand at San Sanam S4. A warm welcome to you both. Um, I was thinking, uh, let's just, oh, we, we have Prachi with us. Hi, Prachi. Hi. Hi. Good evening to you. So Prachi is a director at the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. Uh, before we started, Prachi, we were just discussing that all of us are in different countries right now, sitting in different yes. places. Uh, Marnie is in Australia, so it's afternoon for her. And Amelia is in uh, uh, the Netherlands, so it's early morning for her. Where are you right now, Prachi? I am right now in um, Connecticut, so it's bright and early at 1.02 a.m. right now. <laughs> oh, Prachi, respect. Well done. Thank you. It takes what it takes. <laughs> Right. So I was thinking we'll just directly dive into the conversation and I have a few questions that maybe I could take to each of you. And of course, if anyone else want to jump, wants to jump in and weigh in on it, you're most more than welcome. We'll keep it freewheeling. Uh, but just to have a structure, uh, why don't we begin with Marnie? So Mar Marnie, the pandemic has pushed unemployment in India to record highs, as is with many other countries. Uh, some estimates have said that over 20 million jobs were lost in just the two months of our second wave, which was in April and May this year. Uh, but there are also estimates to say that once the lockdowns of last year ended, jobless, joblessness reduced and it's not so bad now because businesses are being allowed to function. Uh, what's your assessment of the unemployment problem in India? How bad do you think it really is? Mm, thanks, thanks Itika, for the opportunity to discuss it. Um, look, I think almost all businesses in 2020 they shed employees during that period of uncertainty, that unknown future. Um, but I think what we're seeing now worldwide is employment rates rising again as people are adjusting to this new normal situation. Indian unemployment, um, it's similar to global unemployment where there are going to be certain sectors and industries that are more badly affected than others. Uh, so obvious examples, travel, tourism, aviation, they are undoubtedly impacted and contributing more towards unemployment whereas uh, areas like IT enablement services are booming. Um, Indian, I think also if you think about Indian day labourers, they form a large amount of employment um, and they've been very badly impacted due to COVID. Um, and I think this sector is likely to keep seeing unemployment um, due to the frequent lockdown in major cities. And a large proportion of these labourers will be returning to their hometowns, uh, getting involved in family agriculture, contributing towards the despised unemployment. And many of them will remain unemployed. So even after they return to major cities um, after lockdowns, or, or they might not even return for fear of another lockdown. Um, so I think overall unemployment is absolutely a challenge. Um, but if we think about for a moment the developed industries, um, I think we can also say that their scenario is fast changing. Um, Post lockdown in India, technology, real estate, uh, FMCG, they are bouncing back. Um, we can see, for example, metal prices at an all-time high. Um, we can see the cement industry as another example, which is making real estate businesses and construction come back on track very quickly. Um, and again, as I said, sort of IT services. So we think about companies like um, big giants, TCS, Wipro, uh, Accenture, IBM, for example. They've been hiring in four figures. Um, and, and you compare that to the retrenchment that was happening back in 2020. Um, I think another point, if I may, just to make is that right now, India is the startup hub in the world, leading, leading in terms of delivering unicorns in the APAC region. And so that really gives a fantastic boost to jobs and opportunities, especially for people with digital skills. Um, and I think that's a key point, that adoption of technology, um, especially because of the pandemic's impact on you know, remote learning, virtual working, um, that's created huge demand in tech and digital skills. Um, 
And I, and I think just to acknowledge the government as well, the government is supporting in many ways through uh, reduction in duty and, and interest rates. Um, and that's also showing a positive impact overall. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That that was a great synopsis uh, of the overall en- environment and uh, a lot of great points there. But uh, if we could move to narrowing down to today's topic, and maybe I could take this question to Prachi. Uh, so Prachi, research over the last many decades has shown that women are disproportionately hit due to any natural calamity, you know, whether it is a drought or a famine. Do you think that the pandemic has also done the same? Same thing, especially when it comes to job and unemployment, that women have been more disadvantaged. Um, undoubtedly, yes, and I think I'm going to attribute that to both. You know, there's enough anecdotal and enough empirical evidence, I think, to point to that. And all of us coming from different regions, I think, can attest to that in some way. Um, and I always tell people, I think there's enough data for this for this need to say women are, you know, traditionally underrepresented in, you know, many, many different um, fields, right? IT, you know, to um, to your point is, is yes, as to some extent, there's attraction there. But in, traditionally, you know, women have been, I mean, things working against us, right? A, we live longer, we're traditionally represented in, um, you know, fields that are, you um, are, are heavily male dominated, right? Now, everything from construction, shipping, supply chain, right? You, you, um, take a look at it, but overrepresented in service based industries. And from a pandemic standpoint, um, you know, um, specifically, um, heavily, heavily impacted. And then there's the cultural, um, aspects to these things as well. Whereas, you know, what are our roles showing up as, you know, what defines, um, you know, a successful career and then what defines a successful career woman and how we are perceived and how heavily that weighs down, of, down on us. Um, and then, you know, um, so yeah, so I mean, for me, there's, there's the UN report, there's being in the US, the women in the workplace report is heavily, you know, a very, very deep study done there. Um, lots of data. I think it, to me, it's like, how much data do people need now to start acting? Um, and in what I see is, um, the same issues that women faced a couple of generations ago are now handed down in a different morphed way to, you know, the upcoming generation, right? So I am, I'm a big believer of making new mistakes, but sort of handing down the same things is, is really not, um, not acceptable. I hope that answers your question. So true. Yes, it does. Um, Amelia, if I could bring a question to you, uh, following the recent global decline in GP due to COVID, how do you think India will generate enough jobs? Because we are now we know there is a problem. We also know that the problem is gendered. But can the government be successfully interventionist on this matter and open more jobs, especially focused on women and trying to close the gender gap? Do you think that's possible and how? Yes, and, and not only in the context of COVID. COVID has exposed an underlying issue, a systemic problem yeah. that this uh, from uh, the uh, the productivity times that has come from work. The, the there is a shift happening not only in India, everywhere now. So what is exposing is this health, this this reproductive role that uh, falls into the into the shoulders and the hands of women. And so uh, this is, maybe I'm going back in the story of humankind, but this is very important to understand why we need, the government is the one to need to take action, whether uh, in order to resolve, create clear interventions in order to resolve a systemic issue. And this is happening not only in India, this is happening every, everywhere in the, in the world. And that's why it's very important, the understanding of what we are announcing as the UN agenda, the UN agenda, the 2030 agenda, that's created these global goals, especially the SDG 5 on gender equality, recognizes that gender inequality is a global issue. The McKinsey report shows that resolving gender inequality could bring to 2000, for 2025, 12 trillion US uh, dollars in, GD, in the global GDP. But what happens specifically in India, that's why the government should create clear interventions on, resol- on resolving the gender gap, especially in employment policy, is because India has the, the, uh, the biggest opportunity by an increasing of, uh, by 2025, an increase of the 60% of the GDP. 
And uh, these are all numbers that are written down. So that escalates to different interventions, especially in policy, where the government needs to create a clear mapping of economic sectors by regions, understanding what are the gaps and understanding what are, by demographics, what is the composition of these different population of these different uh, regional areas in India, and then understanding how are you making this bridge the educational bridge, the skilling bridge, in order to cross this, uh, this bridge with the private sector especially, and mapping economic sectors. And this is how now restructuring and the economic recovery that you can have uh, the, the COVID necessity, whether restructuring and uh, it was pointed IT sectors or whatever is the industry that you need to reinforce in order to restructure. In the Western society, we are seeing that multinationals are investing as uh, much as before in the supply chain recovery. You see, for example, companies like Unilever with an investment of $2 billion for the minimum wage uh, policy because they need to restructure their markets. So gender, closing the gender gap, and with the government creating an intervention clearly together in partnership with the private sector can map different economic sectors and opportunities in order to bring this workforce into the place. And especially, yes, the needs, the intervention needs to be a, a multi in, a, in a form of a multi-stakeholder partnership to bring this international community in the dialogue to understand what are the gender gaps, because gender equality is not only a market problem, it's a clear social issue with clear issues of sexual harassment, of equal pay, of family-friendly policies that the private sector and the economic and the ministers of economy need to understand in order to change also the paradigm and perspective that women are not just in a minority group. It's not just in a small issue to be resolved. Women around the world are the half of the population and in India count as well. And that's why it has a huge potential on resolving this gap. But it needs to be tackled at the root cause. So the root cause are family-friendly policies and this infrastructure that COVID has shown that especially healthcare, 70% of workers are women facing the pandemic. So if you don't have a reproductive and a healthcare infrastructure, a care structure that can sustain the productivity of the entire country, it's sustained by women with the work that's been and recognized and valued. And that has, of course, an impact in these women and girls around the world. But in India, especially in India, it has a deep impact in their economic performance. And when you look at the private sector as well, there are, there are enough numbers that gender diversity is a corporate performance indicator. Better, it's, it's clearly shown for shareholders and stakeholders. So we need really, the government needs to take bold action in order to make these UN agenda very local and understand the real problems and to become to to set clear targets and measurements year by year so it can be done in a very specific way mm -hmm. um, uh, we have several members uh, uh, in the group now if anyone has any questions uh, that you would want to ask our panelists Please just type them out and I will make sure to include them. Uh, coming back to this point that Amelia was talking about, about family-friendly policies, healthcare, etc. Uh, do any examples, either in corporates, in governments, come to your mind that sort of stood out to you or spoke to you in terms of creating a gender balance or in terms of, you know, including more women? Uh, are there any examples maybe from other countries that you have studied about? Any companies that, you know, could be targeted to bringing more women into the workplace? And I will open this for Prachi or Marni, either of you, whoever wants to go first. Well, maybe if I may, Prachi, I'll just jump in for a moment. Yeah, just yeah. thinking about... Um, uh, so three examples that I have actually where, the, you know, the government's played a, a very decisive role in accelerating progress towards um, parity. Um, so three examples. First example is in Singapore. Um, so the women's labour force participation rate in Singapore has doubled from 28% uh, back in 1970, yes, a long time ago, but to 58% in 2016. And that's a reflection of a range of policies that the Singaporean government put in place. So helping women to achieve that work-life balance by um, including paid uh, maternity leave, uh, paid and unpaid childcare leave, 
increased tax relief, uh, tax rebates, childcare subsidies, these points that Amelia touched on as well. Um, a second example is in Japan. Um, Japan actually offers the most generous paid paternity leave in the world, um, but there were very few men who were taking this advantage because they felt that it was an unacceptable step. But after the former Labor minister declared himself as someone who really values playing their part in caring for children, um, the participation in that Labor ministry paternity program has risen from 14% to over 40%, um, which I think is another great example of, of role modelling for men in the situation. Um, and then my third example I was going to throw in was around um, Canada. Um, so Canada is an example of how the government has played a key and decisive role by creating opportunities for women in the form of um, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau um, naming the country's first gender balanced cabinet uh, back in 2015. And that created significant momentum uh, towards gender parity and was called out by the UN um, as achieving uh, gender equality and empowering women as the single most acted on sustainable, sustainable development goal in Canada in 2017. Um, so, Itika, just, just three examples to, to add to that. Oh, yeah, Prachi, anything you want to add? Sure. Absolutely. I'm just, just underscoring, Marnie, I think you give the best examples possible. I, I do think where um, in the U.S., a couple of things I'll add, especially around private sector, um, is a, you know, entrepreneurship, venture capital, at least going into um, ensuring, you know, women have a different path than just employment, right? There is the the aspect of, um, I don't want to call it a minority business ownership anymore. I think that is a misnomer to some extent, um, but really around um, supporting, you know, or rather reducing barriers to entry barriers to capital that, you know, prevent women from succeeding. And then at the, in the private sector space, just, you know, adding some things around um, benefits, definitely paternity leave, but hugely um, men role modeling, um, caregiving responsibilities, um, stepping up and um, really fighting stereotyping and tokenism that women face in every, you know, aspect. Um, somebody mentioned um, harassment is a very common experience. And, um, and uh, you know, just these women tendency to short sell themselves all the time, right? And sort of helping, so, um, you're smiling and I think you can relate with that. All of us do that. Absolutely, time. absolutely. Uh, and being very cognizant of that. Um, one other trend I would say is sponsorship from an advancement standpoint where there are male sponsors for um you know, female um, workers um, is a big, big one, right? This is no way to say, you know, you're part of becoming a boys club, but really around, you know, somebody being vocal advocates of, of women otherwise would not get an opportunity or speaking for someone in the room, right? Especially in a boardroom or in a senior management setting where um, someone is um, representing you. I think that's a huge um, uh a, a huge factor uh, in women's progress, at least in the corporate settings. Um, there are several other, you know, unique solutions tailored to each company, depending on sort of what their representation and makeup looks like. Um, I do feel, I think one thing um, I always add in a panel like this is we need more men on panels like this, uh, which I think is a humanist opportunity. It's against women beating the door to say, you know, let us in. And I don't think that should be the case at all. Um, more men, you know, in the solution making process and more men standing up and sort of role playing, um, you know, the need to, to um, you know, to, call, to close gap or do whatever it takes at this point. Mm -hmm. We have men attending, so there's <laughs> some, <win. laughs> right? So my next question goes into, you know, the overall impact of lockdown and unemployment. So after India saw last year's lockdowns, the government has res resisted imposing very strict blanket restrictions on businesses, uh, especially for small businesses. But still, jobs haven't really picked up as, you know, one would have expected them. Uh, there have also been anecdotal and evidence, uh, in fact, little data also about, you know, how some people who lost their jobs during those four months of lockdown may have, like, you know, fallen out of the workforce forever, especially women, yeah. you know, because because the lock the nature of the lockdown was such that domestic demands increased. And, you know, it's it's anyway so hard for a woman to in, in this part of the world to get out and work for the first time. But to relaunch their careers is even harder. Uh, what do you think India needs to solve this issue? And maybe we could begin with Marni and then we could go to the others. 
Mm, sure. Um, so uh, government obviously needs to continue to play a, a pivotal role in supporting industries and they need to really take into account that the waves of, it, waves of infection disrupt employment. The cycles of locking and unlocking and um, the economy is going to destroy livelihoods. So really that proactive management of the disease in such a populous country uh, really is an essential point. Mm -hmm. um, just, just broadly, um, being a Interesting, I think being a pharmaceutical manufacturing hub, the pandemic has ironically boomed, uh, boosted the pharma industry and companies. Um, so about 75% of the medicines, uh, vaccines and the peripherals being used globally have a tie up with Indian companies. Um, so I, I do want to acknowledge that has created jobs. Um, but the unemployment challenge, it's definitely going to linger uh, in blue collar jobs. Um, the skills and, and expertise um, that's what's winning in today's employment market, which means a focus on education, um, a focus on a return to work opportunities. Uh, we, we've internally in our company, we've created a um, an internship program. So it's an internship return to work targeted specifically on women um, who've been out of the workforce for an extended period of time. Uh, we're bringing them in on an internship for six months, building up their skills, um, uh, with the with the vision of having them join us as employees after that six months internship per, uh, period, um, so I just I, I just really want to re-emphasise. I think that that focus on education in the current climate, on building skills and expertise, um, that's what's going to to really help um, resolve the unemployment issue. Um, in case anyone else has any thoughts on yeah, this. I'll just, again, underscore what you're saying. Thank you for put, setting it up for me. I think it's, it's more about the reskilling and upskilling of tomorrow's workforce as well, right? Just with all of, all the things that are going on with technology. I mean, it cliched again, I'll say AI data, you know, AI um, data science, machine learning, things like that. Um, blockchain, robotics, you know, you name it. But there's a lot of opportunity for upskilling and reskilling women, um, you know, if they were in, as part of these programs of, you know, coming back or increasing workforce participation. One thing I do do see as an opportunity is really redefining what an office environment looks like. I think there is such a an acceptance to say an office environment means a nine to five in a certain location, which I mean, COVID has very well demonstrated that it can be done. You don't have to be in a certain place. Um, and women's careers in general, right? We see that as a linear trajectory and it's never. Women have a more intermittent career and that just should be an acceptable fact and make that the basis to say, how can we redesign, you know, what this new sort of, you know, when we're trying to create or, you know, create more opportunities for, for um, reintroducing women back into the workforce rather than think of it as a lost opportunity. I think there's tremendous opportunity in empowering these women and let them make their, and give them the decision-making power to see what that looks like, right? Instead of fitting, I call that a square peg round hole issue where it's, um, you know, you're trying to fit this and it just doesn't work, right? Just redefine what office looks like and everything else falls in place, right? How do I make sure my employees show up in the best way, um, best way possible and give them what they need to succeed, right? There's tremendous talent in India. I grew up there. My family's still there. Um, I've seen everything, you know, happening through COVID very closely. Um, my aunt still works in the central government, you know, so I know sort of like what sort of the culture is there, what culture is in the private sector, um, you know, and, and you mentioned it's really a social, political, techno problem is what I call it in a very... Um, you know, layman terms um, that needs to be that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Right. So one problem that we've had for ever is about, you know, the, the income disparity or uh, the income oh, gap yeah. between the two genders. Uh, now, you know, given all the disadvantages and of course, it's it's much more disadvantages for women who've fallen out of the workforce. But for those who are still here, uh, I mean, do you think that the pandemic may have made the problem of income gap even deeper or even wider? And why just income gap, you know, even even uh, gendered uh, promotions or, or, you know, career advancements in that sense, uh, because we are all remote right now. And and like you said, that uh, women undermine themselves, starting with that issue, maybe. Uh, and either of you could uh, take this question. Do you think that that in the whole, you know, the movement of women getting their space at the workplace, the pandemic may have sort of set us back by several years. Amila, would you want to weigh in on that? 
Well, so um, it has not set us back many years. It has made it visible in North, it has made visible what was always an underlying issue. Eh? So uh, this question go back, I'm always trying to go to a very systemic point of view because then you find uh, who's, who's trying to resolve this issue is the woman who's experiencing that individually. So she's trying to enterprise, she's trying to create her own solution. But here this is the responsibility falls onto the corporate governance of the company. Mm -hmm. And corporate governance now we are having, when you look at it from the systemic perspective, uh, we uh, companies need to integrate what is that the ESG standards, environmental, sustainability and governance standards. So the, the world is not only facing a gender issue, an inequality issue. The world is facing many systemic issues and the private sector and governments have the major responsibility here. So how do you tackle these issues? And when you mentioned the pay gap is one of the first symptoms, the most visible symptom, because if you would measure gender inequality by sexual harassment is a much more sensitive topic or other uh, indicators of inequality, or like family-friendly policies, the lack of family-friendly policies, this discussion is very difficult to, to be brought to the, to the right table. You need to have the right table, the right people, and the right decisions. And that's why you need more women into decision-making positions in order to tackle this, to role model the right solution for the problem you are facing. So in this case, we would be talking about corporate governance and how CEOs really are competent enough to understand what is the global situation. Uh, as the colleague was mentioned, what is your local, uh, what is the country political environment? And what is your economic uh, situation at this point? And with the pandemic. So the pandemic is showing one of the first waves of the next sustainability issues we are going to face everywhere. You can see in Europe two days ago, uh, Germany is underwater. You can see many countries facing things that, that are unprecedented. These unprecedented uh, situations are going to stay. So it's a moment, not just a one single woman saying my, my pay is not in place or I don't have access to maternity care. We need to understand what is this gender issue and how this gender gap issue is affecting the overall sustainability situation. How is affecting society? How is affecting our economy? How corporate governance, good governance needs to tackle this situation? In this case, how do we restructure our economy? How do we restructure our societies in order to move from not a reset point of view, but how do we really tackle these systemic issues? So from this point of view, uh, when a company goes into analyzing their pay gap, this is the first symptom, okay? Like you test if you are positive or negative, this is not going to resolve your problem with COVID. But this is the first symptom you need to understand on how are you dealing with gender diversity in your composition. As uh, she was mentioning in an entrepreneurial way, you can you can measure this access to capital on how your country, your sector is ready to uh, to give opportunities to all of these uh, restructuration of uh, a restructuration opportunity. So yeah, I would say let's measure. You have a lot of tools today in the market that can help you to analyze this pay gap and can make you. And then when you analyze your pay gap, you make it visible what are the underlying issues. Is a is a problem of maternity care? Is a problem of component of composition of the corporate board? Is a component of family friendly policies? There are many systemic dimensions, but especially the company needs to understand that diversity and inclusion is it should not be an standalone uh, item or department in your in your company. It should be a business strategy. Gender closing the gender gap is a strategic business issue and is an economic uh, issue at the country level. So when these agents come into the place to understand that we need to mainstream gender uh, policies, whether it is an, an economic policy, an employment policy, in childcare, in healthcare, in all educational system, this is when you can find the actors to come together to find real solutions uh, starting from today. It's too late today. I would say that today it's too late. But really these agents can come into place and to take realization. So for me in this moment, I don't know who's in the audience, but it's a call to the corporate boards in order to tackle this issue seriously, to take systemic decisions in your operationality. So you just need to understand 
how and where do you operate? And how do you mainstream this sustainable impact in your mainstreams of uh, valuing your capital? And women are part of your human capital. Uh, it's not to not underestimate the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in our last 15 minutes, and I would want to again uh, remind the attendees, if anyone has any questions for our analysts, you can type it out in the ask question box on the right corner of the screen and I will make sure to include uh, it in, in the conversation. Uh, so, I mean, we are, we're nearing the end of this conversation and I feel like maybe there is a need to step back and we, we were talking about women who fell out of workplace or women who are in the workplace uh, already, in the, in the workforce already. Uh, I have an anecdote from India to share with you all. So uh, there is a domestic helper who comes in my neighborhood and works in houses. And she had uh, several years ago married her 13-year-old daughter. Um, uh, and, and over the last five years since her daughter has been married, she has had three children. And uh, this woman who sometimes, you know, comes to my house and uh, helps me with my household work or just we sit and chat and I'm always curious about what's happening with her life. She's curious about mine. She told me over the last two years that I've known her that she will never marry her other two unmarried daughters too early because she says that I see how hard it was it is for my eldest daughter and I'm going to make sure that I don't do the same thing to my younger girls etc. Uh, she was even putting her younger, younger girls to twins she has daughters in school in a government school um, right. and and it was great and you know the kids are very bright they work really hard etc. But then the lockdowns happened and they do not have two smartphones forget to they don't have one that she can leave at home for her children to attend online schools uh, also unlike private schools which lead a lot of emphasis on buying new macbook airs and buying new smartphones to attend classes and downloading 13 apps to interact with the teacher uh, government schools in india could only manage the bare minimum i'm not saying they didn't do enough they did well within whatever means they have government school teachers in india are especially very dedicated towards their children uh, but now what's happened is that she is she is leaving those two daughters alone in the shanty in a in a slum mm -hmm. where she lives and coming to work every day and she feels that they are both not safe a because they don't have anything to do they don't have any school they don't have so the school was providing them with midday meals so the lunch was sorted the school was providing them with stationery or colors or paper so they could spend their evening doing something they are young girls about 11 years of age and she recently told me that she is looking out for groom now because she wants to get them married because she feels it's unsafe to leave them the whole day where they are she can't bring them to work with them and of course one wants to help but maybe this is just one story. I'm sure there are thousands of such girls who had the opportunity, whose parents were trying to, like, you know, go against the tide and make things their fortune, their, their lives different from how their lives are. But they probably have just, you know, fallen out of the system and forever. Uh, I, in fact, know of one girl who was also a domestic helper's daughter, who was married last month. She is hardly 13 years old. She used to also work with her mother. And then they did not find work because people st stopped calling uh, a helper in because of COVID. And so she was just married off to the first guy who was available because her mother refused to leave her alone in the slum in the house because it's not safe, etc. So could we spend the last 11 minutes of the conversation that we have to discuss you know how will we ever make up for this loss it is very heartbreaking because these are women i know who wanted different for their daughters and now perhaps yes. their daughters will not get an opportunity i mean i i keep wondering what can government do to solve the situation do you guys have any inputs on what you think the government could do like you know maybe a nuanced policy to to reverse this trend you know these these girls deserve a chance they could have been us they could have been in 20 years sitting here and discussing like us and now they are their lives have moved back in time right either of you prachi do you want to go first i was actually going to say i'll i'll you know to your point your story is representative not thousands um it's it's millions right i grew up around that um this thing it, it's it's not something new so 
you know, all of you who've worked in India, you know, there is the India you see online and then there is the India that you see on the road, right? And we talk about corporate policies, but I really say it's around, there's a there's a true social issue around how women are treated. Um, I grew up in New Delhi, which was in, in the 1990s, which was not a very safe place at all. Um, and it's probably one of the reasons and I could get out because I had the wherewithal, you know, I was blessed enough. And um, anyway, so... I'm very passionate about the topic, but I'd, I'd, I'd like to defer to both of you to see what your perspective is outside and then I'll add on to it. Um, but yes, my heart does go out. There's, there's, it is heartbreaking. I, I don't know what else to just, just say at this point. No, of course, uh, what you mentioned, uh, corporate policies are not the only solution, eh? but yeah. when we are talking about the government acting and intervening with clear policies, of course, we need a partnership and corporates can create a huge impact in investment in solutions. But in this case, uh, now that, that's, uh, that problem you are mentioning now, that's beyond corporate policy and gender diversity and entrepreneurship. That's uh, a clear, uh, uh, it needs a clear active policy, as I see it in two aspects, in education and into other kind of regulations onto banning child marriage. Okay, not as a solution, but then you have the problem of traffic, uh, human trafficking, etc. Many, many underlying issues of resolving poverty, of resolving inequality, of resolving this lack of development. And in this, I would say access reproductive health. So sex, sexual, uh, yeah, everything that is uh, around sexuality and reproductive health available for all kind of communities. And in this case, I think, uh, so acting at the, at the community level is imperative in order to reactivate uh, the situation. So yes, the jump to the corporate world to support the educational system. So the government needs really to tackle this issue at the community level and to work with civil society NGOs in order to reinforce in any way possible the access to capital, the access to education, the access to uh, any tool you need, but especially as well the access to health care. So these again are very sensitive topic when we are talking about not only sexual harassment, uh, we need to really ban child marriage once and for all in all of countries and and yeah, and to prioritize educate girls to to uh, to uh, to be uh, to be educated and to really understand their self worth, their self value. No, so for all of these mothers that they don't know what to do with their girls, um, of course, let them uh, empower themselves as well. But the, the themselves relies on the government relies on a systemic problem that needs to be tackled at the community level and they need to have access to all of these opportunities. And as well, if it's not marriage, to offer capital as well for girls that at this age can find social solution and they can start enterprising. Instead of being married, they can, they can start as well enterprising at their at 16 years old. This is happening in Europe as well, so not at this level of child marriage. But if girls do not find a way uh, in, in education, they can have access to invent themselves through other sources. You find mm -hmm. African countries having a lot of oh, yeah. solutions by these amazing women. So what I would say to the corporate world and to the, the global community of investors to really look at these opportunities to invest in all of these girls. And then mm -hmm. society, when, in your question at the government level, at the policy level to ban child marriage and to give access to reproductive health. So, uh, you know, uh, so they can decide when and how to give birth, even if they are married, even if they are forced into or arranged into a, mar uh, a marriage. Uh, there's a reader comment that's come for me which says Itika should take the responsibility of education of the maids' children for free and maybe even collect some aid through NGOs. Uh, you're an editor to create impact. Well, uh, Mr. Narayanan, yes, I have helped her out, not just me, and you don't need to be an editor to do it. Yeah, many yeah. women in my neighborhood, many households in my neighborhoods have stepped in to help. But this, a, this is just one case and how many can I help? And B, it is a very cultural mindset thing. So I can offer to help her, but she has to be willing to take that help. And it doesn't help that everyone in her circles is going in one direction. So if I, I mean, I, I offered her a laptop and I offered her a phone and I offered her to bring her kids to work for me, etc., etc. But A, the other person should be willing to take the help. 
they wouldn't because they don't know anyone else who's doing it and they would want to do what their relatives or friends are doing so there has to be a holistic change of change in by the which can come from the government and i cannot help so much uh, uh anyone else yeah and again you know you said child marriage child marriage has been banned for several years yeah. in india yes. right it's just something that is overlooked and and absolved many a times i just feel um you know you mentioned african countries as well and and um to your point around um you know women not receiving that help again us as women we are we are self respecting yes we all have worth issues i'm also an executive coach for women you know so go through so your the individual stories in and of itself and where you fit in are just such strong narratives that it's very hard to fight against but specifically for india and this is why i said i get very passionate about it it's just growing up in india in the fear of physical fear you know living in the fear of your physical safety um is a is a very um strong emotional tax right uh, women live with every day and the level of objectification of women um and you know just thinking of women as you know even if you're a daughter you're a sister you're a wife or in any role that you play but a woman um is secondary right so the holistic approach would be here not you know not just to say okay hey did you end up helping that woman no there's probably like i said there's millions of them pick any city in india you can find you know just anybody walk the streets right really around how what sort of so like i said there's an online india and then there's the real you know sort of on the on the ground india right um and just the that that level of objectification has to shift and um it, and it's it is still being handed down and that's sort of like my pet peeve around let's redefine what that looks like um yeah and i think just to echo a single sentence um itika if i may but just to echo what everyone's okay. been saying that whole focus on community you know it's, it, you've got to bring it down to that that small groups and bring the community into it um and with education being at the core yeah. of it i mean education that's a very broadly defined word um and it needs to be in this particular example yeah and and i i do want to add that that you know we always trust on women have to get better there was this case in india for after a long you know around some sexual harassment or rape i forget which one it was where the woman was asked why were you so loose there was it wasn't about you know and this is not the first instance right and i will use this platform to say that women are blamed but i'm like i said men have to be part of the solution you have got to you know start looking at women beyond those in your household a look at them equally not just for your you know you tell your daughters you can do anything you can study anything you can be anyone but then you know the equation changes after a certain while or when you leave the door right so men being part of the solution is a big big um big factor which is truly missing i feel i mean outside i mean it's the policies women can keep fighting as much as we want to unless there's some sort of a um a collective you know community impact to your point Mhm. Mm Prachi you're saying that you can tell women that you can be anything and then change but I feel like so many of us the moment the child the girl born start yeah, absolutely marriage for some reason. Yeah. I, which is very absurd you know because like I have a young daughter I have a 4 year old daughter and I yeah. have had my elder relatives asking her who will you marry when you get married yes. and yes. you get older yes absolutely and i find it so absurd she doesn't have the concept of marriage she doesn't have the concept of yes. sky properly right now yes. like, what are yes. you talking about yes i okay. absolutely i mean, i've been asked the same things right and if you're not if you're a certain age and why are you not married and what's wrong with you right so there's yeah. all this you know this emotional tax in india around what your image should be and women almost in in this situation they almost need the permission right like you were offering her the laptop she doesn't even have the you know the permission to 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 accept that yeah. help yeah um and yeah. and we do that in our own advancements right for women who have the opportunity even when i coach women it's it's amazing you know how sometimes in again we're solution finders also we're very driven when you have a 4 year old to take care of you'll take what opportunity you have i mean hats off to us making it this far with the with the chains around us is what i say right to a great extent but you know there are some very very good men who have supported this cause i think we just need more of them and mm -hmm. you know to, to uh, there is there is a question we have uh, from an attendee mr narayanan again about what's your views on young indian women especially entrepreneurs and i will grab this first because i have been covering technology and entrepreneurship in india um for 15 years now uh, they are great they are very bright just as bright as the men entrepreneurs male entrepreneurs but they are very few 
they are very very few india's uh, especially yeah. that in the tech entrepreneurship system india's prestigious technology institutes the iits the mit the the uh the iits the bits the iims bits yes. they are all heavily male Man. dominated even today there is a very gendered problem in stem education in india which just reflects in the entrepreneurship also so for instance uh, all of india's unicorns except for one which is nike which sells beauty products and a great platform also but most of them are founded only by men Man. um that is and and that's a problem that's inherent with us even if you look at our legacy companies the boards are filled with men yeah men 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 women men 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 so they are very bright they are amazing but i feel we need many more of those prachi would you want to say anything to that oh absolutely i think that representation of south asian women across the board right if you look at south asian men and how they were, you see the ceo of microsoft you see the ceo of google um you know again just you see that representative of now this carrying forward into other country i'm not just i just quoted the couple because that's what popped in my head but it's very very common um in in india because of the sheer population find women finding themselves in situations where there's more men um is very very common right um and the sense of community of women is absolutely in another room where you go and sit with your aunts and you know your moms and whatever else you're smiling you know what i'm talking about but um that first place second place happens it's a very subtle dynamic that's got a shift i think that's where it's going to come from and when i said yes you are told you can be anyone with the exception of marriage you know or with the exception only if you do it this way you can have whatever you want and that never really so it's 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 a very interesting um interesting experience and i've lived it to some extent um and then i'm you know so yeah I just wanted to add one more point here if sure. I may and this is why I think that that and again someone said it today already but that joint and equal ownership yes. of women in leadership uh, opportunities you know in Sunam S4 we've got a 60-40 ratio of uh, in favor of women we've got 46% of our leadership roles being held by women and we are very focused on ensuring that it's men equally present and owning yes. our women in leadership um, campaign um and that's because you know as someone said it's it's wonderful that we have four women here having the conversation we need men to be equally having the same yes. conversation and owning that yes embodying that really inside and outside the workplace mm-hmm. all right we've run out of time thank you so much for giving me this opportunity it is It is always, like I said before we started, it is always fantastic to sit with women and talk about these issues. But it's especially helpful when we bring women from different parts of the world into this conversation with their own context uh, and understanding. Uh, have a good night and a good day, according to the time zone that you are on, and look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, everyone.